She is a fellow and past president of the Society of American Archivists. Anne is involved in the Social Science Research Council's Committee on Libraries and Archives of Cuba and a member of the Advisory Committee of Portico. I first met Anne years ago at a, um, a almost week-long workshop on digital preservation that really was the event that got me interested in this topical area and gave me the foundation of knowledge that I carried forward from that point that she and uh, Nancy McGovern taught. So I have a, a personal uh, debt that I owe you, Anne. So um, I am delighted to have her as our closing speaker, and let me turn it over to her. Well, Martin, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. It's been a stimulating two days. Um, I am conscious that I am the last person to be speaking. I will try to um, move this along uh, expeditiously to uh, draw on some of the experiences we have had at Cornell in open access and sustainability, and then some um, offer some concluding thoughts before we move on our way. So many of us, uh, uh, many of the speakers have talked about the open access uh, momentum that is um, underway, the, uh, the rationale and the incentives for moving in that direction have been pretty well articulated. Martin talked about the rising costs, the unsustainable business models. Uh, Jim Glidden talked about open access is going to be uh, part of the scholarly communication landscape. Uh, people are moving in that direction. We have noted that both uh, internationally and within the United States, there are mandates uh, coming out of the, the federal uh, agencies, uh, the White House, uh, mandates in uh, three states, New York, Illinois, and California are underway to open up the uh, research that is supported at the state level. And we've seen uh, many, many different um, flowers blooming in terms of open access through publisher uh, efforts, um, author, library, consortia, institutional and petition-based efforts. Um, open access is uh, growing rapidly. The annual growth is at about 30% per year. Rem Crow, in an interesting piece recently, uh, suggested that if the, you know, uh, his projections are correct by 2025, 90% of all, all material, all articles published uh, could well be open access. We've certainly seen publishers embrace it heavily. 45% of all uh, open access journals are supported by publishers. And it's been interesting to watch uh, the sort of um, the fifth estate uh, take on um, a, a great interest in uh, the costs of publishing and the opportunities for open access and reusability of materials through such things as the petition-based efforts at the White House, uh, the cost of knowledge uh, petition, which uh, really uh, was instrumental in having Elsevier move away from supporting the Research uh, Works Act and opening up back files for math monographs and uh, agreeing to reduce the costs per item. So I think we will see more of that sort of um, large petition activities in this environment over time. Um, just to sort of highlight the, uh, the serials crisis within research universities, you can see the large, the large um, uh, line is the increase in serial expenditures since 1986. It's up 402% uh, where monograph expenditures have just risen 71%. Certainly clear that uh, this is straining our ability to support um, all manner of uh, scholarly uh, materials that are out there, and there have been uh, real concerns about, um, I think Martin mentioned, just keeping up requires a, an incredible amount of resources being devoted uh, every year to the collections budget. 
I want to talk a little bit now about Cornell's open access. Uh, and like a number of you, I give my bona fides about our support uh, we give at the office. Uh, we are supporters of Spark. Uh, the, uh, we have a uh, open access publishing fund that is co-funded um, co by the library and the provost. Uh, we are members of the Biodiversity uh, Heritage Coalition, uh, Hathi Trust. We support Scope 3. We have not one, not two, but three institutional repositories. Um, we have been supporters of PLOS. Um, and uh, Biomed Central. And um, we have uh, tried to speak our own truths in terms of the kind of materials that we are making available as well. Digitized public domain material from our special collections and elsewhere. We've totally lifted any restrictions on their use by anybody. Um, and then there, uh, I want to. Uh, then turn to three case studies, Archive, Euclid, and Signali, where the library is uh, deeply engaged in scholarly publishing processes, or at least scholarly dissemination. A number of uh, folks have mentioned Archive, which is a 22-year-old e-print repository. Uh, it has heavily influenced the nature of physics, mathematics, computer science over the last two decades. It's fully embraced by the scientific community. There's over 150 scientists worldwide who engage in the, uh, uh, on the boards, uh, serve as subject moderators, assist in the process of getting um, e-prints up quickly. It takes about 24 hours from submission to when it is uh, made available. Um, next year, we anticipate at the rate of submissions uh, that we will um, pass the million uh, e-print mark. Um, and the, the, the use of it is pretty incredible, 64 million full text article downloads last year. Uh, this uh, repository came to Cornell in 2001, came to the library at that time when Paul Ginsberg moved from Los Alamos. Uh, we were given a year or two of, of, of support, and then it fell totally on the library's budget. And it runs up about mm, half a million dollars a year. Uh, one could say 50 cents an article, that's not too bad, but it's year in and year out, a half a million dollars. And we still support the full extent of um, publication, scholarly publications in the domains covered by archive. So like many institutions, as the economic uh, crisis hit Cornell and Cornell Library, uh, something's got to give. Uh, so in 2010, we began to uh, investigate the possibility of a broad-based uh, community-supported um, coalition, uh, looking at voluntary uh, contributions from the top 200 institutional users worldwide, uh, the libraries and uh, the research labs. Uh, here you can see uh, the uh, distribution by domain name. Lots of folks uh, from the United States, the EDU uh, domain name, uh, the US government, about 3%, uh, UK, Germany, uh, Japan, Italy, France are all uh, big users. Um, of, of the archives as well. Switzerland, CERN, of course, is there. Um, we asked those who, by, um, uh, by downloads of use, the top 200 institutional um, repositories around the world, to voluntarily con contribute um, up from anywhere based on their use from about $1,500 a year to $4,000 a year. It was also uh, gratifying that the Simons Foundation has provided us with a five-year grant of $1.75 million to act as, a, as leverage with those uh, in cost uh, sharing, matching those things. And here are, the to date, the uh, institutional uh, subscribers, uh, members of the archive consortium here. Um, this was produced uh, earlier this month, and we're now at about 170 total members. Uh, 86 of them belong in one of five consortia. Uh, the CIC, uh, California Digital Library, JISC in the UK, um, CCSD in France, um, in Germany, and also in Japan. So, um, 
uh, the uh, Simons Foundation has agreed to um, review their uh, support uh, in five years with a, uh, an opportunity to continue with an another five years of funding. Um, I, I'm pretty gratified by the uh, support that has come out around the world for this. And I'm cautiously optimistic that we have secured Archive's future for the next decade. And God knows what scholarly communication in this domain will look like uh, 10 years out. Cornell will commit to all of the indirects, which are not inconsiderable, plus $75,000 per year. Our second um, foray into scholarly publishing um, was a project uh, to focus on supporting independent and society journals uh, in uh, the domain of mathematics and statistics. This was begun with Mellon support in 2000, and I can't overemphasize the importance of Mellon and other funding agencies in priming the pump for looking at uh, e experimentation and new models of, pu of publishing, so we're quite grateful to them. Uh, this is uh, one, um, someone mentioned earlier that uh, they're the niche, I guess it was Tyler, niche uh, disciplines that are falling below the economic radar of um, commercial and university presses. And, um, oops, sorry, that's the next uh, thing. <laughs> Mathematics and statistics are being um, sort of um, sucked up pretty rapidly by the major commercial publishers. And this effort was to really develop um, opportunities first for them to get online and uh, to remain independent. And uh, through a, uh, a collaborative effort of supporting uh, their online presence with added functionality uh, without sacrificing their intellectual and economic independence, um, providing full text, uh, search capabilities, reference linking, interoperability through the Open Archives Initiative, long-term retention, uh, and access to foreign markets. We were able, through our partnership, to um, uh, beat, uh, break into the Chinese market. We've just done a, a, a major um, uh, uh, licensing arrangement with Brazil. We're looking at other areas of the world where um, the uh, economic crisis isn't quite so quite so heavy. Um, we have 36 publishers who work with us, um, and I'm really pleased that while we have been self-sufficient uh, since 2006, last year our annual uh, revenue went over a million dollars. Um, the increased uh, revenues are um, uh, pumped back into the publishers. Um, and um, um, we are uh, also very um, happy to support through some of the subsidies open access journals on this platform as well. And indeed, 70% of the million and a half pages are open access uh, materials. I think uh, there's two things that are important about this, this uh, project. One is uh, the library at Cornell and Duke Press have partnered in bringing their own special expertise to the table, but each is enriched actually by uh, the complementary strengths. I think um, uh, Cornell's um, ability to work in international markets has been extremely helpful to Duke Press. Their thoughts around how to best package and distribute it and, and add bells and whistles has been really important in the technical development at Cornell. And I, uh, the cachet of, of Duke Press and Cornell Library, I think, is a good, uh, good combination there as well. I also think that it's important that this has as a, uh, a sort of a unifying theme, it is a subject domain focus. So we enrich it not just by the journals, but also uh, monographs, open access monographs of, of mathematics material and other material, and we're looking at data sets as well. This is just the uh, business model. Um, we are uh, playing with pay-per-view and print-on-demand primarily because the publishers are interested in seeing that, but uh, frankly they don't um, add much value at this point. Uh, third, third example is the um, 
supporting monographs in uh, um, niche domains. And this is the case with Signali, um, which is a, um, a publishing venture between Cornell University Press and Cornell Library. There's a joint imprint on that in modern German letters, cultures, and thought. Um, this began in 2009. Again, Mellon was instrumental in helping us. Although the library uh, put up some funds, as did the Dean of Arts and Sciences. We each put up $60,000 toward it, and the press came in with um, uh, their strong support and encouragement as well. To date, we've published nine titles. Uh, two more uh, will soon be out, and three have been conditionally accepted. Uh, one of the books has received honorable mention from uh, MLA's 2012 prize in German studies. Another was uh, one of Choice's 2011 outstanding titles. What I think is interesting of the um, 14 um, authors of these, eight are junior authors. This is their first uh, book, uh, and they are non-tenured, while the others are mid-career or senior authors. The key elements of Signali is this um, collaborative effort uh, uh, by faculty, by the library, and by the press, and the Dean of Arts and Sciences. Um, there is uh, the uh, faculty and the dean's, um, uh, dean is supporting the s uh, series editor. There's a very strong local editorial board because German studies is one of those uh, strengths at Cornell. And um, the library supports the managing editor. Our uh, selector for German studies is PhD uh, from Cornell, Kaiser Walker, and he also serves as the managing editor of this. It takes about 20% of his time. Um, and then the press is focusing on the production and marketing. Um, much of the content is free. Uh, the first book was totally open access. And then uh, online, we turn on the Google um, uh, access capabilities at about 50%. Um, we're also looking very much into a moving wall. The idea is to uh, sell copies of it until we can recover the direct out-of-pocket expenses associated with, with these. And uh, we have identified those as, and our goal is to keep them at under 7,000 per um, volume of direct costs. Um, ironically, the uh, sales from those first uh, volumes um, average $7,300. So we see that as going back in to support more volumes uh, coming down uh, the pike. I do think, though, that as we look at this over time and the press is making strong noises about how they have to recover some of their indirect expenses, we're going to have to look at uh, author subsidies as well. Um, new forms of scholarship. So far, we've just been focusing on sort of the straight, uh, linear, uh, long treatise. But uh, as with Anvil Academic and other uh, activities, we're looking at new forms of humanistic and social science scholarship. And I just love uh, these uh, books. Uh, this was from Werner Pfeiffer's um, uh, display of, um, of new book forms. And the last one at the bottom is uh, the difficult chapter. So I like all those spikes. But um, at any rate, we're looking at this. But uh, issues, again, around uh, the acceptance of uh, and standards that are in place for scholarly production um, in terms of impacting uh, promotion and tenure really need to be worked out. So general, general kind of thoughts, this, none of this is uh, rocket science here. Someone always pays in open access, uh, whether it's the library or the end user or the author or the institution uh, or a collective or a press, the government or a foundation. Someone always pays in open access publishing. But there are ways to make it sustainable. Um, I think we, it begins with really understanding what's the intent behind the open access scholarly communication process. Is it simply to communicate, uh, to stake claims? One of the values of archive early on was the timestamp of, of the first um, instantiation of a, of, a, of a line of inquiry. Uh, and also the very quick uh, getting out of the information. Is it to simply disseminate uh, knowledge? 
Uh, is it a form of publishing? Um, does it, uh, is it absolutely essential in the reputation building of either the institution or the author? Um, what about preservation and, and the, uh, the importance of citations and those kinds of things? All of that needs to be pretty clearly understood. Um, I think it's also key that the quality is understood, the reputation is, is well defined, uh, that the impact, we talked a lot about impact, uh, uh, can be measured in palpable ways and that the community that surrounds it this is both the authors and the readers are committed to this open access environment. It's like, you know, if you had a party and nobody came, uh, it, would be, um, it would not be a successful effort. Um, I think we also need to recognize that as scholarly communication is disaggregating, there are opportunities um, for looking at uh, ways of communicating, disseminating, publishing, and peer review that are not all bundled together, but uh, actually can be stretched out, um, stretched out more. And a number of um, new ventures are underway looking at, say, uh, using archive.org as a way to do the peer review process post-dissemination. Uh, Frontier's par uh, paper's merit is gauged after publication. PLOS accepts 80 to 90 percent of, of material that is uh, submitted. Understanding the full costs and the efforts of publishing, not just those out-of-pocket expenses, but also the costs of the, um, the scholarship, uh, the editing, and the review process that goes in, into it all needs to be understood, even if it is not money-changing hands. Um, and, and working toward the driving down of uh, costs probably will require that we begin to build these social compacts within the academy and across institutions. And I'll say more about the, that in a minute. Uh, I thought that uh, Tyler's comment about uh, collaboration being high-hanging fruit uh, is really an important point, that it is tough. Uh, uh, our tendency is to stay within our silos, but as our dean of agriculture and life science uh, once said to me, and even farmers don't use silos anymore. <laughs> And the importance, uh, the absolute importance of um, experimentation. Um, as Kathleen uh, Skinner noted, uh, Catherine Skinner noted, we need to experiment. We need those stories of open access publishing and sustainability. Uh, we need to continue to monitor these promising new efforts, uh, Dartmouth's uh, effort, the uh, Anvil Academic and others uh, out there. We need to um, sort of keep our hands around all these bewildering new uh, things that are, that are going on. Peer J, eLife, Figshare, the Knowledge Exchange, Lulu, uh, Amber, uh, of course the uh, Library Publishing uh, Coalition, MLA Commons. Uh, there's a bewildering, wonderful, uh, vibrant um, uh, form of experiment and engagement going on right now. Uh, F1000, I mean, all of these are just, uh, just pretty, pretty amazing. So, concluding remarks. Some of the takeaways from this conference. First is scholarship is a community act by and for the community writ large. It begins with public libraries as people develop their sense of knowledge, and taxpayer-supported schools, and taxpayer-supported research, and a rich scholarly ecosystem provided by the Academy. As Kathleen Fitzpatrick noted, uh, there is a need to see scholarship not as a private responsibility, but as a public good, worthy of public support. Uh, and your phrase, uh, scholarship, uh, scholarly publishing is uh, all tale, was, was a very chilling kind of, uh, kind of um, uh, description of the state of scholarly publishing. Uh, she evoked the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to uh, reposition our view uh, that the value is giving it away and paying it forward, the 12th step. I would also include the first step admitting we are powerless and our lives have become unmanageable uh, in the current publishing environment. Second, 
Open access as a published good doesn't mean it's all good, as Jeffrey Beale's presentation on predatory publishing uh, demonstrated. Um, and for open access to thrive, it must be subject to um, Brit's uh, critical spirit, the scrutiny. Uh, it needs to morph from a uh, hothouse uh, orchid into a rugged uh, native plant that can withstand uh, public view, um, uh, criticism, um, and bad practices, uh, understanding that bad practices are there. Scholarly publishing literacy is something we should have been doing all along, but it's even more important in this e-world where anyone's a publisher, uh, anyone's a sucker. Um, and Jeffrey has noted that predatory publishers have greatly exacerbated author misconduct. I'd suggest the biggest authorial uh, misconduct is in information trafficking. Uh, probably the biggest open access repository we have out there is BitTorrent. Three, recognizing the rights of authors and readers um, is really important, and many of us spoke to, to that uh, in, this, uh, in these last two days. But I'd also th say the middle agents are, in, are important, and their rights and responsibilities are critical as well. We need a diverse publishing ecosystem out there, which includes commercial publishers, scholarly societies, independent uh, consortia, independent publishers, university-based uh, publishing, and alternative models for this whole environment to thrive. I, like it, I liken it to food security. Uh, without a strong base of diverse seeds, food production is threatened by disease and climate change. Seed security can come from preserving seeds in an underground bunker. Uh, but even better, seed security uh, comes from seed sovereignty and the right to use and exchange seeds freely within a community. As uh, with the domination of one type of seed, the whole of food production is threatened, so too is scholarship. Half of Cornell's um, con uh, content, electronic content, uh, the, the budget for our electronic content goes to just three publishers, you probably can name them. Elsevier Wiley Springer. So we've certainly witnessed uh, digital hegemony over the last decade or so, but I am also worrying about its leading to digital homogeneity uh, in uh, the uh, uh, coalescence of all scholarly output into the hands of very few. And it's a huge risk uh, of vulnerability that I think open access can help us to prevent. Brit Holbrook reminded us that open access is not a monolithic thing, that the perspective of the person in the chain must be considered, uh, that it will vary across disciplines, and that um, if the argument is solely based on must-dos and mandates, uh, acceptance may well be uh, on the order of compliance not embracing fully a new social electronic Im imaginary um, and the co-production uh, of the future of scholarship. Methinks we need both carrots and sticks uh, to ensure that this, uh, this transformation moves along quickly. And he also gave us a, a list of 56 indicators of impact. It reminds me of uh, stockbrokers wanting the market to move. They don't really care that much whether it's going up or down as long as it's moving. So um, the impact factors, good and bad, I guess are good for business. Nancy Marin joined uh, uh, Britt and others in urging us to look beyond um, uh, open access to impact and the importance of engaging audience rather than assuming if you post it, they will come and that they should come and be happy and grateful for it. Uh, I'm reminded of our Making of America uh, content that we have uh, opened up to the world uh, from 1990 on. I was persuaded by the technologists that it would, uh, the cost would be mere noise to open it up to the world, not simply to the Cornell and Michigan communities. So we did so. 
Uh, well, the cost in technology may be very little, but the cost in terms of responding to unaffiliated users is um, significant. Uh, not just technological issues, but they want, you know, full research services. And when we changed uh, one of our software programs, um, they got pissed off. And uh, uh, they uh, wrote uh, and uh, circulated a petition for all of those unaffiliated um, MOA users saying we're not going to take it anymore. Um, but the point is that they are right. If we open things up to the world, we have a responsibility beyond our ken uh, to provide uh, and support and maintain and grow and respond to that organic nature of the full continuum. So I agree with Nancy that uh, we should strive to create a renewable system, one that is worthy of public support, but also engages the public broadly. Um, and as Catherine Skinner noted, innovation uh, comes not from the center, but from unexpected locations and networks of people, and that includes our publics. To effect change requires the full range of stakeholder involved involvement, and I would uh, argue that it needs, uh, there is a need for us to operate at scale, huge scales. Uh, we should begin, I think, with uh, who controls what pieces of the puzzle, what are the bottlenecks, what are the pressure points, what are the drivers, and who controls the various levers. So let's think about the scholarly monograph. We've got issues around technology. We've got scholarly experimentation going on. We've got tenure and promotion. We've got uh, the need to seed, uh, uh, provide seed funding and encouraging environments. We've got tastemeisters. We've got costs. Um, we recognize where bottom up is critical, but we also, um, as the Birds of Feather Working Group noted in future trends, some things need to be done top down. Um, so, could we bring key players to the table with their dowries, funding, reputation, technical savvy, know-how, authority, uh, and build intervention strategies to address uh, areas where they're most at risk and most vulnerable? I think Tyler's right. If they're satisfied with the, um, the, the communication process and the scholarly publishing process, it probably, you know, doesn't need fixing right away. And if Fred Moody is correct that digital humanities scholarship equals career death, how do we go about changing that? So we need a robust, uh, supported model combining the old and new in uh, scholarly monograph publishing, which is cognizant of the differences in disciplinary needs, which engages the authors, the editors, the reviewers, uh, uh, critically engaging them early uh, in a period of commitment. Perhaps um, uh, inter inner institutional work is where uh, most of this needs to take place. Um, can we divide up the landscape in a collective fashion where 10, 20, 40, 50, 100 universities come together and agree to, one, invoke new measures for tenure and promotion? Wow. Uh, signal intent to move to E only within five years. Uh, share technical, editorial, process know-how. Uh, BJ's uh, point about National Faculty Board was an interesting model to look at. Um, can we develop this uh, as, and promote a high quality, rigorous kind of process which saves uh, and holds on to the best of the scholarly monograph reputation building, but also engages in new ways of going about doing that business. Can um, various universities or university presses specialize in key areas? If Cornell is doing German studies, can North Texas do another uh, field? And um, that the collective provides the imprimatur of quality and reputation across the whole, the whole consortium. Can we provide startup funding collectively and measure those full costs? Can um, we provide scholars uh, who are in, uh, you know, actually independent agents with a CHIT system or subventions within this community or without 
to publish their first one or two books? Can they be empowered uh, by this committed community as free agents and encouraged to stay within that con consortium? Can we establish cost recovery models that uh, perhaps as interim measures uh, to recover costs, not to gain profits, and then move to the open access uh, moving wall with all rights uh, conveying thereof, and to help support the next generation of, mono of monographs? Can we develop rigorous systems of assessing value and the importance of, and usefulness and audience engagement and reusability and, and the ability to build upon? Um, can we develop, in fact, an integrated secure metric across a whole bunch of different kinds of consortium so one feeds the other and the action actually is in the sinew and the blood that connects those, those efforts, that network of network, but the, the, the stuff that connects all those networks together. My favorite quote is from John Kenneth Galbraith. Um, when faced with the need to change uh, or proving there is no need to do so, uh, most people get busy on the proof. Um, I think that this, um, this, uh, this two days has helped us think about ways not to get busy on the proof, but to get busy on the change. And I thank you all very much. Well, I have one, Anne. Oh, darn it. I was, <laughs> I was hoping I was out how, of here. How do you see uh, institutions? I, I think the scenario you, you played out of uh, universities sort of taking responsibility for individual areas um, of scholarship, you know, uh, uh, marginalized or otherwise, or, or core uh, areas of, of scholarship. I mean, like high energy physics, pretty important area. How, how do you see the coordination of that? Mm -hmm. or, or, I mean, not that anybody's figured this out yet, but what are some ways of trying to get traction on that notion? Well, I'm reminded of uh, some of the early efforts within the Ivies Plus to do collaborative collection development. And, uh, <laughs> boy, there's an oxymoron. Um, so after a great deal of uh, study and, and bargaining, um, Yale agreed to, uh, to collect for the consortium everything on the bassoon. And Cornell uh, agreed to cover lace making. There were a ton of subjects in between that, that probably were worthy of, of uh, similar kinds of concentrated effort. Um, I really think it's going to take um, you know, that whole top down through bottom up. Where is the concentration of interest and capabilities? Presses already have some um, reputations in particular areas. And it may be one or two or three presses combined together to support that that community of, uh, of interest. Duke has a strong uh, mathematics uh, focus in their work. I also think it's going to take the AAU um, working within uh, their, their efforts, uh, various scholarly societies, um, faculty on campuses, uh, libraries, and uh, university presses. Someone was mentioning how difficult it is for university presses to collaborate. Um, there's so such 20th century models. Uh, you know, it's necessary but insufficient to have a great university library at any one institution. Um, that's just the beginning point. And I think we should be seeing it in that way as well about uh, the scholarship that emanates from these institutions. Uh, I actually have a question too before, and then I'll give the mic to Sandy. But um, the symposia like this can be a little bit like church camp. Um, where you leave all on fire for Jesus and within a week you're fornicating. Um, and so, <laughs> when you get home. But uh, what I'd like to ask from you, uh, especially for some of the grad students in the room and the early career librarians, is what can they take from uh, something like this? What can they do uh, when they get home? Um, what should be the first thing they do when they get home? Um, 
and I also want to thank you for your wonderful synthesis of, of the, the different talks. It was, that was, I think it was really nice to see the, the narrative arc play out. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, graduate students, you know, you know, there's this whole business about graduate students not wanting to put their dissertations in um, uh, institutional repositories because they're fearful of its being scooped, um, what, whereas UMI is already doing it. Um, I think uh, I think it was Fitzpatrick. You were talking about the uh, humanists and they're sort of uh, coveting everything and, and, and closing, it, closing it off. You gotta get over that. Um, by sharing it, um, it can uh, it open up. Um, it can also be enriched by commentary. It does place a stake in the ground that, you know, this is where it was first presented. Um, so I would encourage um, grad students to engage in um, what their universities have to offer in terms of uh, supporting their scholarship, um, and also to look at alternatives to the traditional models of publishing, um, and, and look at where are the alternatives in open access publishing in their particular domains. The visibility issues, I think, are probably more important at the graduate student level than at any other level. Thank you. Uh, there was. There's one example of the kind of uh, collaboration among uh, presses uh, that you were talking about, and that is a few years ago, the, the Mellon Foundation right. seeded uh, various projects for first books in uh, some fields of the humanities that were considered endangered. Uh, Penn State Press was there in art history along with Duke and mm -hmm. Penn and University of Washington Press. Um, but what was very odd about that initiative is that unlike previous Mellon initiatives which were very forward-looking and look, looking, you know, towards uh, electronic types of publishing. This was kind of retrograde in that it emphasized print monograph publishing mm -hmm. um, and didn't want to hear about open access at all. So it was, a, it was a, a, an effort that was really helpful in one sense, but wasn't very forward-looking in another sense. Yeah, I think we can't engage in new models just to revert to type and, and, and support, support those old types. Uh, you know, this issue, of, we gotta get over the, you gotta have a print volume uh, in your hand for publication and tenure. Uh, even in um, Signali, which was originally supposed to be just electronic and, and uh, print on demand, a very limited print run, the sort of Trojan horse, uh, driving in uh, was necessary uh, for the untenured um, uh, um, faculty who were publishing their first books. The print monograph? Yep. You can't get Amazon you have oh, no, you, I mean, all of these are available on print, uh, on Amazon print on demand. Yes, but that's what I mean. You have to have a print component. No, no. Oh, you have to have a print, but it doesn't have to be up front. It could be in the in the demand process, right? Yeah, print on demand was not uh, deemed sufficient. Any any final questions for Anne? Oh, Daniel's all right. Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, regarding Dr. Martin's comment uh, about discipline-oriented. Uh, speciality uh, in addition to institutions or libraries uh, can we uh, bring professional societies or Sorry. learning societies in a more you know responsible way to because that's the main reason why open access is not really leaving the ground to reach the critical masses so how can we really engage professional society to address from uh, reviewing to the whole process of you know, scholarly communication. So and I, I want to hear your comment about uh, the professional society's role in this model. Thank you. Yeah, I think that professionals, you know, I, I was pleased to see in the library publishing um, the LPC presentation that they were looking at beyond simply the library uh, or the university as publisher, um, you know, locking up uh, all of that scholarship within uh, the academy, uh, th that construct strikes me as 
um, a little like depending upon, um, you know, the hybrid seed corn um, when there's a blight uh, somewhere else. Um, I think that it is important that there is a role where commercial presses play, where scholars, scholarly societies play, where independent publishers play, where scholars collectively are much more powerful than scholars individually on a particular campus. So maybe you start, you know, with that, uh, is there an agreement there across a, um, a broad swath of the discipline in terms of where they would like to see um, the venues for publishing um, exist? How would they, they be supported? Um, some of these are just going to dry up anyway because they're, you know, the 40 books that get sold aren't enough to uh, sustain it in, in alternative processes. I, I think that in a consortium um, of players, there's also pro bono work that needs to take place that each institution or each entity has to agree that they will support a particular area, come hell or high water, in terms of the funding model. And that money and resources change hands across that environment um, of the consortium of universities and presses and scholarly societies and, and uh, disciplinary boundaries. Well, okay. Um, please join me in thanking Anne for her Thank comments. You. They were wonderful.